The Chevrolet Corvair is often viewed as an American oddity, a car that was radically different from all of its peers in the 1960s. It is the most influential car General Motors has ever produced, paving the way for both automotive engineering and automotive safety. So if you are interested, I'd like to tell you the story of America's most unique production car. The story of the Corvair starts with one man, Ed Cole. Born in Marne, Michigan in 1909, Ed was enamored with cars and racing from an early age. After enrolling in General Motors Engineering Institute Flint in 1930, his talents were cleared all around him. He was pulled from school early to work for General Motors Cadillac division, and by 1943 he was appointed Chief Design Engineer for the United States Army's Light Tank and Combat Vehicle Program. By the end of World War II, Cole was promoted to be Cadillac's Chief of Engineering. During his tenure at Cadillac, Cole presided over many projects that would define the brand's future, such as the new Cadillac V8. Cole's pet project during this era seemed somewhat strange to his colleagues at General Motors, a rear-engine car dubbed the Caddyback. The Caddyback was a car with a V8 in the rear, opposed to the more conventional front-engine position. The project was eventually scrapped because of inadequate tire technology, among other things. But Cole never forgot the lessons he learned from the Caddyback. Cole was promoted to chief engineer of Chevrolet in 1954. Around this time, Chevrolet was trying to come up with designs for a small car to compete with the emerging European import market, but had been unsuccessful in creating an adequate design. Cole was worried about the future of General Motors. He saw a market filled with almost identical, large, front-engine, rear-wheel drive cars, and knew that General Motors needed to innovate in order to differentiate itself in this oversaturated market. Cole called in his director of research and development, Maurice Ali, and explained to him his worries. Cole directed his team to come up with a car radically different from the norm, a challenge that the R&D team was happy to undertake. Cole gave very little directions to the R&D team, trusting his engineers to come up with good ideas themselves without any corporate meddling. Ideas were thrown around for the next few years until designs started taking shape. The car would be rear-engined, air-cooled, and with an aluminum engine to help with the weight distribution. Ed Cole was promoted to general manager of Chevy in 1956. The same year, a man named Don McDonald replaced Ollie as the head of Chevy's R&D. During McDonald and Cole's first meeting, Cole gave McDonald his first directive, get going on that rear engine. With that, the program that would eventually become known as the Corvair went into overdrive. The styling department had been told the car needed to fit six passengers, but still be both small and light. By 1957, the department presented their concept to Cole. The design was radically different from anything Chevy had made before. Cole was delighted and told those at the meeting, let's build it. There was one problem that Cole had conveniently ignored up until this point, the General Motors Engineer Policy Committee. Normally when a new idea was proposed, it had to be greenlit by General Motors management. Cole had been ignoring the stage and had essentially been going rogue for years. Cole was lucky that the GM president at the time, Harlow Curtis, was also a forward-thinking man who agreed with the idea. With Curtis's blessing, Cole was clear to proceed with his new car. The development of the Corvair was not without speed bumps. Engineers initially faced two problems with their independent suspension idea, the engine and the tires. Independent rear suspension was by no means unique as many European cars used it. But Chevy engineers wanted to utilize a larger, more powerful engine. In order to keep the weight down, this new engine needed to be constructed with a low weight metal like aluminum. Using this much aluminum in an engine was rare at the time and Cole was stumped on how to get a large, steady supply of the material. Cole eventually made a deal with Reynolds Aluminum, a large aluminum manufacturer, to build a reduction plant next to Chevy's new casting facility. After many long hours of casting and testing, the first Corvair engine roared to life in December of 1957. The other problem Chevy's engineers faced was tires. 
After testing a multitude of existing tires and finding them inadequate, Cole contacted United States Rubber to make special tires for the project. To try and keep the car's true form a secret, Cole gave very little specifications to the engineers at US Rubber, wasting two whole years of research time. When finally told the actual specifications of the car, US Rubber engineers developed a tire for the car that was much lower profile than other tires. By late 1957, these new tires were ready to be put through their paces at the GM Proving Ground track. The Corvair project was veiled in absolute secrecy. Cole was rightfully paranoid about his main competitors, Ford and Chrysler, finding out and sabotaging the new car when it was still in the cradle. The first Corvair testbed was a Porsche, outfitted with the Corvair's suspension and drivetrain. This Porsche was rigorously tested until a new camouflage testbed was made specifically by Chevy. The car was made to look like a contemporary small Buick and was named the Holden. Holden was also the name of a GM subsidiary in Australia, so its name was used to confuse corporate spies. Cole went as far as making fake phone calls to Holden offices in Australia and gave fake directives to throw off any prying eyes. By 1958, the Corvair's design had been basically finalized, and after another year of work, the car was almost ready to be unveiled. But Cole's fears of corporate sabotage had been realized. Ford and Chrysler had unsurprisingly found out about the project. In 1959, both Ford and Chrysler started a campaign against rear-engine cars. This campaign was led by Ford and targeted the more abstract notion of a rear-engine car rather than pointing fingers at any specific car. GM shot back by inviting 30 automotive journalists to a lecture by former R&D director Maurice Ali, where he preached about the greatness of rear-engined air-cooled cars. These campaigns initially confused automotive journalists, who knew something big was coming but didn't know exactly what. Soon their questions would be answered. After much speculation, the Corvair was officially revealed on October 2nd of 1959. The reveal was much different than your average car release. Chevy dealers across America hosted large parties where customers would come in and view the brand new Corvair for the very first time. Many Chevy dealerships lavishly decorated showrooms, provided condiments to customers, and a few even had clowns present to make balloon animals for kids. There was much fanfare and excitement over this new Chevy, and it's unsurprising why. The Corvair was first released with two models, the more basic 500 and the uptrim 700. Both were four-door sedans with a 140 cubic inch flat six that produced 80 horsepower. These engines were attached to either a three-speed manual or a two-speed automatic transmission. The suspension on these new Corvairs was called the Quadriflex to highlight its independent four-wheel suspension. The rear suspension was a modified swing axle design, similar to a Porsche or a Volkswagen. A U-shaped beam provided the mounting points for the rear suspension arms. Shock absorbers and springs were attached to a wishbone completing the unit. A unique aspect of this design was that the engine and entire suspension could be removed and installed in one unit. This modular design helped dramatically when assembling and servicing the vehicle. The largest problem with the Corvair suspension was shared with all swing axle cars, drastic camber changes during harsh turns. This problem called the jacking effect or jacking force has been a well-known phenomenon for years in the automotive industry. I won't go into detail about the phenomenon, but to put it simply, it's the sum of vertical force experienced by the suspension. General Motors, Porsche, Volkswagen, and the National Highway Safety Bureau, after extended testing, all concluded that before such jacking effect can take place, the lateral force on the tire would overcome the friction coefficient of the rubber meeting the pavement, resulting in a skid rather than a rollover of the vehicle. Lethal jacking would only occur in a car in very dramatic circumstances and could be overcome by a competent driver. 
General Motors was well aware of the suspension's unique attributes and attempted to mitigate them when designing the suspension and tires. A transverse monoleaf spring was proposed to completely eliminate any wheel tuck, but upper management did not see the jacking as a deal breaker, as during testing they only succeeded in rolling the vehicle during extreme conditions that any car in its class was unlikely to overcome. But this potential flaw did not go unnoticed. John Bond, editor of Sports Car Illustrated, had this to say about the Corvair in the November issue of the magazine. Let's be honest, as usual with swing axle cars, the Corvair has profound oversteer. With 62% of the weight on the back wheels, it could only be otherwise if a very ingenious suspension technique had been called into play. This was not the case as cornering forces on the Corvair chassis increase. There's an initial, very mild understeer tendency, probably attributive to the rear suspension geometry, but then well within the average driver's range of slip angles. Oversteer sets in in a gradual way that is easily countered by its excellent steering. He went on to write that the Corvair is a genuine ball to drive, but it wasn't the car for everyone. Tom McCahill of Mechanics Illustrated wrote, This is the best handling rear engine car I've ever driven, with none of the flaws usually associated with the design. Tom had driven the Corvair at the GM Proving Grounds on a wet track to try and push the car's handling to its absolute limits. After some dangerous high-speed turn to maneuvers, he stated that, I feel absolutely certain that if I had done this in some other rear engine car, I'd have been grasping a lily and mahogany box before the sun was up. This Corvair is a magnificently handling vehicle. Charles Naples of Motor Trend was more critical of GM's marketing of the Corvair. After he drove a brand new Corvair cross country, he remarked on its fantastic handling, but disparaged the horrendous 20 mpg fuel economy far less than the advertised 26 MPG. Mixed reviews from automotive journalists didn't stop the average consumer from rushing to buy Chevy's brand new wonder car. Corvairs sold out in showrooms across the nation and made up for 35% of General Motors sales that year, about a quarter of a million vehicles. Chevy introduced a two-door model of the Corvair in May of 1960 called the Monza, named after a racetrack in Italy. This was supposed to be the sportier version of the Corvair. The engine produced 15 more horsepower due to a new camshaft and was an instant hit with consumers. By 1961, Chevy had introduced an entire line for Corvair vehicles, including a wagon named the Lakewood and a batch of forward control vehicles such as the Corvan, Greenbrier, and Rampside truck all falling under the Corvair 95 moniker. Riding the initial success of the Corvair, the owner of a Chevrolet dealer was scheming one of the most outrageous marketing stunts in automotive history. Dick Doan, owner of one of America's largest Corvette dealers, was hatching a plan to market the new Corvair to potential customers. Dick was a hobbyist racer and daredevil who held a lot of sway at GM. When Chevy's marketing department was searching for ideas on how to sell the Corvair to customers, Dick stepped up with a pitch. A team of drivers and engineers, led by himself, would drive from his dealership in Dundee, Illinois, to Columbia in a Corvair. It sounds like a simple task at first, but there was a twist. No road connects the country of Panama to Columbia. In its place is 66 miles of inhospitable jungle called the Darien Gap that was at the time considered impassable for a family sedan. Dick was going to challenge this assumption. The journey down the Pan American Highway itself was harrowing, but the real challenge hadn't even started yet. After crossing the Chukunake River, the three humble Corvairs plunged into the dark jungle. The footage obtained was simply outstanding three little sedans struggling to overcome the worst the jungle could throw at them. The three plucky cars drove over swollen rivers, deep ravines, and through thick underbrush. Eventually, both support vehicles were lost deep within the jungle, leaving only the Corvairs to press onwards. 
Without the support vehicles to provide fuel, one Corvair ran out of gas and was abandoned in the jungle. The remaining Corvairs pushed on, and after 100 days, drove themselves out of Darien Gap and onto a Colombian road. The Corvair had defied all odds and made the impossible happen. The adventure took quite the toll on both the cars and the crew. None of the Corvairs ever made it back to the United States. Even more upsetting was GM's lack of care for the project after its completion. The compelling story and infinite markability of such a feat was completely ignored by GM's marketing department. The journey was so underpublicized that it was almost lost to time. Thankfully, filmmaker Leonard Claremont's footage of the ordeal survived and is available to watch on YouTube. Even with a lackluster ending to an otherwise incredible story, the Corvair remains the only unmodified family sedan to ever overcome the Darien Gap. Chevy sold a strong 330,000 Corvairs in 1961 and the prospective sales for the upcoming years looked good for GM. Even with this supposed strong start, not all was well with the Corvair. Ford had continued its smear campaign, making misleading videos and spreading general anti-Corvair propaganda to any newspaper or automotive journal that would listen. Even worse news for the Corvair was the upcoming release of the Chevy 2, a car that filled the exact same niche as a daily sedan that the Corvair did. When the 1962 model year rolled around, very little was changed on the Corvair, save a few performance changes. This included a slight boost in displacement and a posi traction rear axle. The Lakewood was quietly discontinued in the middle of the year as its sales were abysmal. The most plausible explanation is that the prospective customers bought the Chevy 2 instead of the strange rear-engined wagon. Perhaps the biggest change this year was the introduction of a turbocharged 150 horsepower Monza, called the Spider. The already strange American car now is equipped with one of the first standard production turbochargers on an American car. This introduction showed that GM was well aware that Ed Cole's initial concept of a family-oriented sedan was being morphed by consumers into a budget sports car. By 1963, General Motors management was in a bind of what to do with the Corvair. Even with decent sales in 1962, they were well aware that the Chevy 2 was cannibalizing sales in the Corvair's targeted demographic. Plans to update the Corvair started sometime this year. 1964 saw the most dramatic changes to the Corvair yet. A transverse mono leaf spring was equipped to the rear suspension all but eliminating the tuck under effect during hard turns. This improved the handling dramatically. The engines also received a slight displacement boost, increasing both horsepower and low end torque. Curiously, GM did not advertise this increase in performance. The 1964 Corvair was the most advanced Corvair yet, taking the initial concept to its very best. Sadly, this would be the last bit of good news for the Corvair that year. 1964 was a time of great change in the American political landscape. Johnson's progressive era had begun, and all sorts of political operatives saw this as an opportunity to make a name for themselves. The new vice president, Hubert Humphrey, was passing off his committee chair for the reorganizations and international organizations to Senator Ernest Gurning of Alaska. Connecticut Senator Abraham Ribicoff and Senator John McKellen had other plans. They pushed out Goering and split the committee between themselves. Ribicoff was appointed as the executive chair of the reorganization subcommittee, but with no real mandate and wanting to appeal to his progressive base, he started looking for large corporate targets. He settled on the American auto industry after reading a New York Times article about automotive safety. Ribicoff knew very little about the automotive industry but was told of a young progressive lawyer working for the Secretary of Labor named Ralph Nader that could help. In reality, Ralph Nader knew very little about automotive engineering, but what he lacked in knowledge he made up for with being a persuasive speaker 
with unmatched political ambition. Nader had a pet project he had been working on for a few years, aimed at the American automotive industry, one of the political left's biggest targets at the time. He was writing a book about automotive safety, more specifically, how American automotive experts ignored it. He consulted a few engineers and automotive safety experts, such as Andrew White, when writing his book, but the reactions he got were not exactly supportive. This research led to his now infamous book, Unsafe at Any Speed, published in 1965. To quote Andrew White, Nader seemed to be under the impression that the roads in America were strewn with wrecked cars and dead bodies, and that the American automotive industry should be placed completely in the government's control. As Nader was writing his book, there were a few lawsuits aimed at GM over the Corvair, for all sorts of reasons. But the main issue was the car's handling stability. These types of lawsuits are nothing unique, but suddenly GM was inundated with lawsuits involving the Corvair. GM's chief legal counsel, Alonius Power, was getting suspicious that there was something underhanded going on, as Nader, a now self-styled Corvair expert and chief critic, was not listed as legal counsel for any of the Corvair cases. Nader had also recently written a journal article titled Profit vs. Engineering about the Corvair in the far-left publication The Nation. In this article, Nader professes that the Corvair was intentionally designed with a malice-driven profit motive. Upon reading the article, Powers grew even more suspicious about Nader's intentions, thinking that he had some personal beef with General Motors. Powers decided he needed more information on Nader and hired a private investigator to go to Nader's hometown in Winstead, Connecticut. The PI found out that he used to be a paperboy and has a very opinionated father. Not exactly what Powers was looking for. Powers then made the worst decision of his career. Being the busy man that he was, he handed off the reins to Elian Murphy, the GM law librarian. She proceeded to hand the investigation off to her friend, Richard Danner, at Alvord & Alvord Law Firm. Danner then passed the job off to Vincent Gillen, a PI from New York. In this long line of an investigative telephone, Powers' initial orders got somewhat distorted. Gillen found the same information as the previous PI did. But Murphy insisted they dig deeper, as she was convinced there was some kind of deep conspiracy going on. This is where the story gets somewhat unclear. It is known that Gillen interviewed many of Nader's associates and family members. It is also known that they did occasionally tail Nader. This led Nader to grow more and more paranoid about the people around him. Nader claims he was called hundreds of times a day with prank calls and threatening messages. There was supposedly a recording of these calls, but it was conveniently lost in a fire. One of Nader's other claims was that GM sent him prostitutes on two separate occasions to sully his reputation. This claim was never verified, but Nader's growing paranoia convinced him that almost everyone was a GM collaborator. He took these stories to a leftist journal, The New Republic, where they printed Nader's claims as indisputable fact. Other more left-leaning publications like the New York Times and the Washington Post soon started running the story themselves. General Motors CEO at the time, James Roche, then made the biggest public relations blunder of the 1960s and admitted that they had a PI surveilling Nader to see if he was involved in any ongoing General Motors lawsuits, but that they hadn't harassed him in any way or solicited prostitutes. Senator Ribikoff was delighted about the entire situation and called both Nader and Roche before his committee to hash out the matter. Before this hearing, Roche restated that there was a PI following Nader, but denied Nader's more colorful allegations. Roche then made the bad situation even worse by apologizing to Nader for the PI. It's too bad that Nader wasn't there to hear it. He had been stranded at his apartment all day. He didn't have a car, and no cab would take him to the Capitol. Strangely, Murphy was never called to testify. She was there and probably had the most information regarding the matter out of anyone involved, 
but she was suspiciously excluded from the hearing. Why, we will never know for sure. The United States Justice Department found no sufficient evidence of Nader's claims in regards to the threats or solicitation. But that didn't stop Nader from suing General Motors for $26 million for invasion of privacy. The case dragged out for almost five years before General Motors settled for almost half a million dollars in 1970. A flurry of hearings from Congress about safety and the auto industry followed. In the end, it was inconclusive if the Corvair was a death machine or not. These hearings led Congress to pass the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act, creating the National Highway Safety Bureau, shortly renamed to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. After a lengthy investigation, the Traffic Safety Administration's conclusion on the 1962-1963 Corvair were released in July of 1972. In summary, the administration stated, the handling and stability performance of the 1960-1963 Corvair does not result in an abnormal potential for loss of control or rollover, and it is at least as good as the performance of contemporary cars, both foreign and domestic. After years of slander, the Corvair was vindicated, but at that point, it really didn't matter. Some people point to Nader when discussing the death of the Corvair, but Nader might have single-handedly extended the Corvair's lifespan by half a decade. GM executives were thinking of axing the Corvair back in 1964. They had plenty of good reasons to do so. The Corvair's target demographic, young families, were more interested in the more standard Chevy 2 than the Corvair. Unlike GM's expectations, the Corvair was more popular as a budget sports car than a grocery getter. This put the Corvair in direct competition with the new Ford Mustang, a more conventional, purpose-built sports car. General Motors was already hard at work creating their challenge to the Mustang, but the Corvair was not included in those plans. General Motors had been making plans for an updated Corvair back in 1963, after noticing the popularity of the more sporty Corvair options and the market shift to a more performance-oriented car. The decision was made to make the updated Corvair more like a sports car than a family sedan, and stylist chief Bill Mitchell took up the challenge. After four years of development, the new Corvair was finally unveiled for the 1965 model year. Mitchell and his team had worked wonders as this new Corvair looked like a purpose-built sports car. The engineering team was also hard at work, equipping the car with a more powerful 140 horsepower engine. The turbo model also got a boost from the official 150 to 180 horsepower due to innovations in turbocharger technology. The Spider moniker was dropped for the turbo cars and the name Corsa Turbo took its place. The suspension was upgraded to a fully independent four-link suspension, fixing any lingering handling complaints. When reviewing the 1965 Corvair, Car and Driver magazine wrote, The styling speaks for itself. It is undoubtedly the sexiest looking American car in the new crop, and possibly one of the most handsome cars in the world. That was the last bit of good news for the Corvair as GM executives were done with the project. The Corvair 95 line of forward control vehicles were unceremoniously cancelled, and in April of 1965, General Motors cut all support for the Corvair, save for legally mandated emissions and safety features. It is likely that the Corvair would have been cancelled entirely in 1965, but the Nader lawsuit was still pending, and cancelling the Corvair would have made Nader look better, even though he had very little to do with the project's cancellation. So the Corvair stuck around as an automotive zombie for the next four years, getting slight tweaks and changes every so often. The last Corvair ever made unceremoniously rolled off the factory line on May 14th of 1969, never to be seen again. A sad end to a truly revolutionary car. The Corvair was a car truly ahead of its time. We have the Corvair to thank for many modern features we enjoy on unibody cars today. 
GM's independent suspension, as well as unibody technology, was pioneered with the Corvair. Even foreign car companies took cues from the unique American car. So the next time you take your modern GM sports car out for a drive, thank the Corvair for paving the way. If you got this far, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Sorry for the lack of uploads this year, I've just been really busy. My Trans Am restoration video is almost done, and I have a few LARP vids in the pipeline, so look out for those. That's about it from me. I hope to see you guys out there in the zone.